If Ertz is gone and you have, you know, a rookie Devonta Smith and then Jalen Rager, who's still coming along, I mean, Goddard, for all we know, could get 100 targets this year. And yes, I think it is not crazy to think he would then surpass George Kittle's $15 million per year if he has a really good 2021 season, um, which is why I think you try to lock him in now. Mega Mac guys here with you on Bird 365. We're going to expand the conversation a little bit more. Talk mostly Eagles with our next guest, but uh, he's an expert in topology across the league. And Julio Jones supposedly is going to kind of like Zach Ertz. It, it, it's an inevitability. It's going to happen. Julio Jones is going to be relocated until he is because it hasn't happened yet. Here to talk uh, NFL and money is uh, our buddy Brad Spielberger from ProFootballFocus.com. Brad, Johnny Mac and Johnny Mac, which, how are you doing so far today? Doing great this morning. How about you guys? Doing well, Brad. Uh, thrilled to have you back. One of the best money guys, as I call it, uh, covering this league in, in the business, Pro Football Focus over the cap. You did a great piece. Uh, I guess it was Memorial Day on, on June 1st and, and how it affects the league. Just give us a football for dummies sort of June 1st explanation when it comes to the salary cap. Yeah, you know, I think Eagles fans sh should know it maybe better than other folks. But uh, just on a high level, um, you know, teams can essentially push some of that dead money, um, which is money created when you cut or trade a player, um, you know, prorated bonus money that is going to that guy on the cap but is no longer on your roster. You can push some of that into 2022. Um, now after June 1st. So, you know, the Eagles, you know, released Alshon Jeffrey and Malik Jackson, you know, months ago in March, but they actually did not process those moves until yesterday. Um, and so now, similarly with Zach Ertz, you know, a trade impacts their salary cap differently now than it would have before June 1st um, in terms of, you know, how much dead money they would take on in 2021. And I think most football fans understand this, but for the casual football fans, I think it uh, necessitates a little explaining. It isn't like you're really saving any money. If you wait till June 1st, it isn't like you aren't going to have to pay the piper for that money at some point. You're just pushing it off. So on a year-in, year-out basis, it comes down to what are you attempting to do? Are you attempting to give yourself more flexibility in the given year because you think you can be good, because you think you can make the playoffs, because you think you can make a run, which is always a good thing to do. But if you're paying for it in a, a later year, a year where you actually may have a better chance to have a playoff run, you're actually handy, handicapping yourself a little bit. So it's not quite as easy a decision as we all make it out to be. Oh, give us more salary cap room now. Well, but how are you going to use that salary cap room and what kind of dividend is it actually going to pay? Yeah, that's 100% right. It doesn't disappear. Uh, you know, I like to say it's like a credit card, not a debit <laughs> card. So you're, you're eventually paying that that charge. Um, you know, I think, of course, this year obviously being the, the loan exception, but generally the thought is, well, the cap's going to go up by X amount every year. So, you know, that'll kind of absorb that extra debt money and, and we'll, we'll be able to spend around it. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, and uh, otherwise for the Falcons with Julio Jones, they just need the room to like sign their rookie draft class and just, just get above <clears> water. So that, that's, you know, an even more dire situation. So, uh, Brad on your piece, and I encourage everybody to look at it at profootballfocus.com. You not only explain some of the, the higher profile players, actors being one of them locally here in Philadelphia, but maybe Julio being the most notable besides the quarterbacks that could potentially be moved. I wanted to ask you from a larger perspective, because you've heard the cliche that you don't pay age in this league. Over 30 is kind of a bad word. You've done the, the work on the, the general managers in this league, their history of moving players. How, how many people come off that template? especially for contenders and saying, you know what, we're close. We got to go for this. Who cares if somebody's 32? This is a Hall of Fame player. Or or does everybody in this sort of group think mentality, oh, we can't give up draft capital. We can't do this. We can't do that. How, how much do GMs in this league come off that template? Yeah, you know, I think it's really tough um, to stick to not adhering to that human element, um, you know, of roster construction. 
I mean, look, the Eagles are probably one of the clubs that are more inclined to, you know, stick to the numbers, trust their, you know, their analysis and, and take the kind of personal and emotional aspect out of it. But you look at them and, you know, you have Jason Kelsey, you have Fletcher Cox, you have a lot of these got Brandon Graham with his, his new deal. Like, and yes, no, none of these are breaking the bank now or, or some of these deals were signed earlier and now there's kind of the end of the deals. But like you said, they saw a window, they had a championship window. Um, but I also think those guys are probably leaders in the organization, um, you know, leaders in the locker room, bringing the young guys along and stuff like that. The intangibles that, um, you know, maybe analytics or whatever would say you shouldn't be paying big money for that. But it's an unavoidable and necessary component to building a, a winning culture and, and, and a winning chemistry on a team. So I think every team definitely falls for, like you said, they might tell themselves they shouldn't or they won't. Um, but then when that guy comes up for new money, they just find it impossible to do. Um, I do think Ertz is kind of in a pinch where those other guys maybe came up for new money when they were still kind of in that window and, and Wentz was still maybe playing well and they thought they could kind of run it back again like 2017. Now I think they've accepted that they're rebuilding. Um, obviously, you know, have a bunch of draft capital going forward and they're kind of going to overhaul this roster. And so now he's a guy where they, they cannot justify it, even if he is one of the most you know well-liked guys they have in that building. Brad, when John and I started the show uh, more than two months ago now, um, certainly we were in the midst of free agency in the National Football League, and we talked about not only individual players, but positionally things looked like the Eagles needed to do, things they needed to address. And I kept harping on pass rush, that I thought they needed another edge rusher, and another week went by, and another week went by, another week went by, and they, couldn't, they never added a pass rusher. And then all of a sudden, they signed Ryan Kerrigan of the Redskins, who was a guy I had been talking about for the better part of a month, and said, hey, I think this is a nice signing. I know he doesn't fit the uh, profile of the type of player the Eagles would be looking at if they're in a transitional year. But I still think he's got something left in the tank. And then we got the details of his deal. And they got him what I thought that he had a specific number he was targeting. That's why he hung around in free agency for almost two months. The Eagles got him for what seems to be a very reasonable number for this upcoming season. Give us your take on Ryan Kerrigan, what his eventual cost was, and if you think he does have something left in the tank to help the Eagles pressure the quarterback this year. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. Uh, I think the thing with Kerrigan is, I mean, just incredibly durable and consistent for you know the better part of a decade in Washington. Um, I want to say he didn't miss a game for you know his entire career there until until this last season. Um, you know, where he missed some time both by, you know, injury and also just by, you know, better, better players than Chase Young and Montez Sweat, just kind of pushing him down the, you know, the depth chart. And I think that's the key with him now is that, you know, he can't play 800, 900 snaps in a, in a season anymore, or if he does, he's not going to be highly productive. But we saw even last year, you know, he played 300, 400 and in those snaps, he's still getting after <laughs> the quarterback at a high pressure rate, um, you know, just wreaking havoc when he does get in the game. And so I think, it should probably be more of the same. I don't think you want him starting necessarily or playing, you know, significant snaps unless I guess he has to if, you know, Josh Sweat or, or Derek Barnett get hurt again, um, which, you know, isn't isn't outside of the realm of possibilities. So I agree with you, though. I think it was a good value. I, I think it's also great whenever you can kind of poach a, you know, longtime rival, you know, division rival player. Um, but I do. I think he's going to help. I, I think also, you know, this, this defensive line has pieces there where, you know, people will pay attention to Graham or pay attention to Fletcher Cox and maybe Kerrigan can kind of get free um, just like, you you know, he did on, on a loaded defensive line in Washington. So I think it was a great signing. Like you said, it kind of waited. It, it took so long into free agency. You wondered if he was holding out for something. And it, it looks like they got him for a, a night, not a bargain, but a, but a very good deal. Brad, I want to circle back to Zach Ertz because you mentioned something about you can't justify paying him. He's going to be 31 in in season this year. So He's past that demarcation line. But I want to turn you towards the other tight end, Dallas Goddard, who was eligible for an extension. I think people are going to be shocked if he bets on himself how much money he is going to get. Um, and I think the Eagles would like to act quickly and get as team-friendly a deal as possible. Now, they still have cap issues. So, you know, they have to create space and they'll get some money whenever they do something with Zach. And there's some other mechanisms and values, so they can probably get something done. But if Dallas Goddard has a year people expect, could he become the highest paid tight end in football? 
Uh, without a doubt. I, I think folks uh, I actually tweeted about this yesterday. I, I think it's easy to forget, um, you know, how thin and how scarce tight end still is in the National Football League. I mean, yes, we had like a Kyle Pitts this year go, you know, top five, which is crazy. We've had, you know, TJ Hawkinson. So I think we're seeing some big names start to go early and it's becoming more of a kind of prominent position. But you still look if you look at the last two seasons which, you know, tight end is a slow developing position. So we're looking at uh, Goddard's second and third year in the league. He's top third in the NFL in, in receptions. He's top third among all tight ends in, in yards <laughs> per route run. He's, I want to say he was eighth in um, like receptions per receiving snap. So when he's not blocking, when he is running a route, you know, he's top quarter of the NFL among all tight ends in terms of getting the ball thrown to him. And that's with Ertz who is like top 10 in all time tight end receptions, you know, for a career, you know, on the roster with him. So if, if Ertz is gone and you have, you know, a rookie Devonta Smith and then Jalen Rager, who's still coming along, I mean, Goddard for all we know could get a hundred targets this year. And yes, I think it is not crazy to think he would then surpass George Kittle's 15 million per year. If he has a really good 2021 season, um, which is why I think you try to lock him in now, as you said, and I still think you're paying him, you know, Hunter Henry and Johnu Smith got twelve and a half million per year in free agency. He's better than both of those players. He's already done more statistically than both of those players. Um, yes, free agency, you're going to get paid more than a, in an early extension. But I still think if I'm his agent, I would say you know thirteen million per year is my absolute floor. Um, and if I'm the Eagles, I, I pay him fourteen million per year. You know, below Kelsey and Kittle, and I'm still happy. That's a good payday for Dallas Goddard. I'm, I'm hoping he's watching right now because I think <laughs> you just put a smile on his face. I right, Let's talk about that other tight end of the Eagles who's still here, even though we all continue to acknowledge he probably won't be for that much longer. But as long as he is, the Eagles have to find a way to maneuver with uh, Zach Ertz. I've continued to say that I don't think there's a team out there in the NFL that will trade whatever commodity he is. At best, it's going to be a day three pick. If it's a conditional pick, that seven could become a six, six but could become a five. Best case scenario, I think a five could become a four. So be it. I don't know that there's a team that's going to say, okay, give us Zach Ertz with his contract intact and we'll take him and we'll fit him into our cap. I just don't see that happening. I think whatever deal the Eagles are going to have to make, if it's going to be a deal rather than cut him, Zach is going to have to comply and renegotiate with whatever team he's going to go to next. Do you agree or disagree with my stance that there isn't a team that will just take him as is with the contract in place? Yeah, I agree with you 100%. So the article you know, up on, on PFF.com, um, I have the Eagles still only getting a fifth round pick, and that's after converting $3 million of his $8.5 million base salary into a bonus before they sent him off. Um, so, you know, of course, Philly does not want to take on more money. Um, so maybe they might even estimate, okay, we'd rather just cut them than get a fifth and eat three million more more dollars. I think they'd probably take the fifth. It basically, you know, in their mind, it's all right, we're paying three million dollars for a fifth round pick. Um, we've kind of seen stuff like that with you know a keep to leave trade. It was kind of a salary dump for a for a fifth or a fourth for about five million. So kind of in that same range. So I think they would go ahead and make that move, but I agree with you hundred percent. I don't think anyone is trying to pay him in the final year of a contract. Eight and a half million dollar salary, um, you know, for a thirty-one year old tight end, which at that position is is very old. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. So, Brad, w w it kind of put on your GM cap, then, and put yourself in Howie Roseman's position. Try to explain what he's doing. Is this a game of chicken? Is this a maybe somebody gets hurt on a contender? Maybe a, a Sam Bradford type situation? Not at, as a high profile. A position, obviously, but I know eyebrows were raised uh, when the Bills, who need a tight end, uh, restructured Stephon Diggs. People in Philadelphia said, "Oh, maybe, maybe the Bills will come after Zach Ertz." Uh, what is Howie Roseman doing if the end game is just release? Yeah, you know, I think it's twofold. Um, you know, I think we saw earlier this off season with the you know the whole Wentz saga that. And granted, we don't know what, what was true that was reported. But, you know, when it first came out that he wanted two first-round picks, I think everyone knew, like, that's that's not really a realistic package. Um, but you might as well set the price there, kind of anchor it to that value, um, and then hope that someone just gets desperate. You know, maybe the Bears or the Colts or, you know, other teams in the mix there, you know, gets desperate and just comes over the top and just gets something done. 
Um, you know, they obviously did pretty well. You know, that, that conditional second that could become a first. Um, so maybe he's trying to get creative in another trade like that. You know, you mentioned the conditional component to an Ertz trade. I think that's a smart way to look at it as well. Um, and then secondly, like you said, I do think you say, hey, look, maybe there's a camp injury. Um, you know, it's, a guy goes down and like we just discussed, I mean, tight end is so thin that, um, you know, maybe maybe they say, OK, well, we need this guy now. We, we have a huge hole of this position that we usually rely on. Um, I think I guess lastly as well. I, I do know that some teams that maybe Ertz wouldn't be interested in going to, um, at least last year. I don't know about now. Um, but, you know, I know one in particular down in, down in Florida um, in, in Jacksonville was interested in Zach Ertz. And I think, I don't know this at all for a fact, but I think he kind of would pull a Gronkowski with the Detroit Lions where he basically says, I'm not going to show up if you make that trade. So, you know, if you trade me to Jacksonville, just let them know I'm retiring. Um, so I think that might be complicating things a bit too, that he's kind of holding that, you know, tiny piece of leverage he has as well. No, well, Jacksonville, he doesn't want to compete with Tim Tebow. I can't really say <laughs> I would blame him if he didn't want to go to Jacksonville. Um, you threw the name out there, so let me ask you about him. I was going to ask John about him later. We can get to him now. There's a lot of optimistic conversation, not surprising, but it is coming out, about Carson Wentz in Indianapolis. We sat here last year and watched him play every single game, every single snap. I was a huge Carson Wentz fan and fought off his detractors for the first several weeks of the season. But as the year went on and more games were played, I had to admit – Damn, this guy stinks right now. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure. We all need to give our best guess opinion on what he's going to do with the Colts. I need yours. They are rightfully being very optimistic now, going to his old coach's uh, new spot in Indianapolis. What kind of season do you think Carson Wentz is going to have? Yeah, you know, I think the thing with Wentz was that early in his career, you know, there's kind of two different types of quarterbacks, and, and there's a class above and a, kind of a second tier. Where the first tier, you say, this guy can win in spite of the conditions around him. He can carry this roster even if things aren't perfect. And now I think you kind of look at it and say, hey, look, well, maybe he just had the best offensive line in football for a couple of years. And yes, the Eagles receivers weren't incredible, but they had Alshon and they had Zach Ertz and they had some you know fine complementary pieces. So I think any sort of like optimism in Indy is saying, okay, the offensive line is going to stay healthy and is going to be dominant as they've been at times. And, you know, you know, Michael Pittman's going to take another step and become a, a number one wide receiver in Indianapolis. T.Y. Hilton's going to be healthy and be back to the old T.Y. Hilton. Like, it's not even so much projecting Wentz. It's more just saying his conditions will get back to being perfect and he's capable of operating an NFL offense. Um, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, not game – he's not a game manager, but you know, you know what I'm saying. He's not, like, carrying a team on his shoulders. Um because I agree. I don't think there's any reason to think that he is that type of guy right now. Um, I think the one thing I guess you could say is maybe it was more mental than physical. Um, you know, maybe he just was dealing with all the pressure of, you know, Foles coming in after him. And so he had to deal with that and then didn't like the Hurts pick and then had issues with the, with the front office or issues with the coaching staff. Um, and so now he's OK. He has Frank Reich. He has a fresh slate. I would say the fans in Indianapolis compared to the fans in Philadelphia are probably much more forgiving. Um, and, and there's probably not as much pressure there, yeah. um, you know, and, and the list goes on. But I think if you think he's going to just have an elite season again, like 2017, 2018, that you're just you're just wishful thinking. Brad, I want to take you around the league using your piece from Pro Football Focus. And one is obvious superstar Aaron Rodgers. Another maybe the most. I, I call him the biggest superstar nobody knows about, and that's Daniil Hunter, uh, the edge rusher in Minnesota. Um, Off-season work has varied uh, in different cities, but both the Packers and Vikings still have many camps on the books, uh, I, I believe. If those two players don't show up for mini camp, does that say, okay, they're going to get moved? Is that is that the breaking point? I think that's when things start. That's kind of when the clock starts. Um, you know, that's when the fines get serious. Um, you know, where you're losing like ninety three thousand yeah. dollars a day for those guys. Um, you know, when you're missing mandatory camp. Um, so yeah, I think that's when you basically say, okay, are we going to pay this guy? Are we going to extend this player? I think that applies to both. <laughs> they both have three years left in their deals, but both want new money. And I think, in my opinion, both you know deserve it. Um, so I think, yeah, that's where you kind of realize, okay, like this guy is serious. Um, you know, he wasn't just negotiating via the media and just kind of, you know, having airing his grievances. You know, he really is upset with his position. Um, 
I just don't see a scenario where Aaron Rodgers gets traded. Um, I, I think, honestly, there's a higher likelihood that the Packers call his bluff and he retires and, and pulls a Brett Favre and just does not play um, than that he gets traded. I really do believe that. I think they're a proud organization. I think they are an organization that will say, we will never let a player hold us hostage. Um, you know, we don't let the players kind of run our club type of thing. Um, as for Hunter, you know, I think they want to resolve that. I mean, the defense last year was the worst in Mike Zimmer's career by an order of magnitudes. Um, and particularly the pass rush was non-existent. Um, and he's obviously, like you said, a very, very good player. Um, it's tricky there, though, because he's coming off a season-ending neck injury, you know, which is kind of a scary, you know, waters to navigate. But I think they could find a way where they say, all right, we're not going to give you an extension right now, but we'll move a bunch of money from 2022 up to 2021, or we'll guarantee a bunch more money, and then we'll, we'll revisit an extension, you know, after the season. He's still young. He's only 27 years old. So there's some, something's got to happen. Something's got to give. I don't expect either guy to show up until something does happen. Um, but with Hunter, I mean, look, they traded Stephon Diggs. He had three years left on his deal. Um, he was a star player or, you know, a very good player. Um, so they, they've, they've gone down this hole before. I guess the Packers have too. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think both situations are worth monitoring. Um, like you said, what, when camp starts, you know, in a couple of weeks. Let me ask you the same type of question, same scenario type question about Julio Jones. Um, there wasn't, there's less vitriol between he and the organization than in the other uh, two that we just touched on um, when he went on national TV and he said, I'm out of there. I think that kind of raised some red flags. But uh, during the offseason, there was some good speculation about him being traded, but not because Julio was demanding it or that there was a issue between the coaching staff and the player. It was just kind of a more cap related thing than anything else and a direction of the team related thing um how much is the non-animosity uh, open up the possibility of julio jones and uh, the falcons having to say that right now it's best that we stay the course and you stay here julio and julio says all right i got one more year i'm not going to uh make waves and not show up yeah, you know, I think that comment uh, on TV on, uh, on with Shannon Sharp was not a breaking point, but it definitely was a bit of a bowling point. Uh, I mean, look, Julio's entering the first year of that massive extension he signed, uh, three years, sixty-six million, with sixty-four of that fully guaranteed at signing. It's like it's a it's a landmark contract. It's one of the most important, you know, for a non-quarterback, you know, contract signed in the history of football. And he hasn't even put it down on on one of the new years of that deal. Um, you know, he's a 30 plus year old wide receiver, but I think that comment is an issue because it kills their leverage, right? I mean, it, it says, okay, well, now everyone knows that you're, you're out, you want to be out. Um, you know, I think it's kind of you're past the point of no return when you ask for a trade and the team says, yes, we'll honor that and we'll find a destination for you. Um, to, for a team to say, actually, you know what, never mind, like we, we think it's better if you stay. Um, it's tough. I think it's really tough to navigate. And I think the only way that happens is if, you know, that they, they there's some sort of other resolution, um, whether it be monetary or something else. Um, I do think it's possible, um, but I still really do expect the trade to happen there in the next you know, month. All right. Last one for me, Brad. I want to go circle all the way back to my first question, because you mentioned Stefan Diggs. That worked out pretty well for the Bills. I don't know. Fifteen hundred receiving yards, whatever. I go back to Khalil Mack and. Everybody looking at that trade and saying, wow, look at look at what they gave up. Well, the Bears have had quarterback issues, but Khalil Mack's been pretty darn good for Chicago and that defense. When you have proven players, when you have a Julio Jones, as, as I mentioned before, first ballot Hall of Famer, age we understand, and you look at draft picks and you look at the hit rate, now, I understand young contracts, cost-effective. Is this league undervalue veteran-proven players? I think it's a fair question. Um, you know, I think the Rams uh, have kind of suggested they feel that way. Um, you know, I think it depends on the context of the roster a bit or you know, where your club is at. So if you are the Rams and, and basically your, your worst-case scenario is going 8-8, eight and eight, um, you know, with, with kind of Sean McVay and that, and that roster there, so yeah, your pick is going to be like 18th at you know at, at worst case scenario. I think it's more arguable, sure. Um, you know, I think if you're even a team like Miami, you know, giving up a first round pick to go back up to six to take Jalen Waddle, 
I mean, if Tua Tagovailoa stinks this year, they could give be giving you know um, you know a nice pick back to the Eagles. Um, so I, I think that kind of comes into it a lot. Um, and I would just say, secondly, like it also depends where your roster is at for the acquiring team as well. So you know, if the Rams are going to trade for Julio Jones with whatever picks they have left, like it's more justifiable than if you know, in my opinion, like I don't know, the, the Titans, I guess, kind of makes sense that they have a good team, but they lost so much this off season. Um, you know, and it could backfire in a major way. So I see what you're saying for sure. You know, I think t- some teams do feel that way. Like we kind of overvalue the potential that a pick could turn into a great, you know, rookie contract player. Obviously with the Diggs trade, I mean, Justin Jefferson is already one of the best receivers in the NFL and he now costs, you know, a fraction of, w- of what Stefan Diggs costs. So um, that's obviously, you know, a great hypothetical um, scenario. But yeah, I-, I think it really does depend on kind of the-, the status of your of your club. Um, and, and kind of if there's a, you know, quote unquote window and stuff like that. Same type question, bringing it back to Philadelphia for a second, which by the way, I don't think you have to sweat at all. The Rams going eight and eight or anyone else going eight and eight. Cause we're going to play yeah. 17 games this year. <laughs> Nobody's eight going nine. eight and eight. You yeah. got to either be nine and eight or eight and nine. So you everybody's worried about that. that. <laughs> we're all going to have to get used yeah. to that. We've all been saying eight and eight forever and that's no longer a possibility. Mm. Uh, but I digress. The question I want to ask is about the cornerback position. A lot of Philadelphia Eagle conversation all up. Need to upgrade cornerback. When are they going to get another cornerback? They got to. You can't have Avante Maddox as your cornerback, too, and play him outside. He's got to be in the slot. Yet the Eagles have not signed another cornerback. And there are some veteran guys, pretty well-known names, that are still sitting out there. We're all speculating the reason why they haven't signed is they still have a value and the teams and the leagues still believe the value is less than that. Your perspective, where is the value at for the free agent corners that are still on the market? Are they going to have to come off that number? Are teams unrealistically trying to hold it down? No, it's a weird offseason with the cap uh, being affected by the pandemic and the like. Uh, what what is the cornerback market for those that are still out there? How's it going to play out over the next month? Yeah, I would lean towards thinking the the players may have a, a slightly inflated value or perception of their value, um, just just because, like you said, the nature of the off season. Um, you know, if you want to go down the list, like I think you know Richard Sherman. You know, I had him projected to get kind of a yes, he was injured last year, but still get kind of a you know one year like twelve plus million dollar deal. Um, you know, in twenty nineteen, he was he was PFF's highest graded corner in the NFL. We know he's capable of that play still if healthy, but of course the if healthy is a pretty large if. Um, you know, they got Steven Nelson, you know, in Pittsburgh or from Pittsburgh. Um, that's probably, I think, was probably, you know, a, a separation between what he thinks he should get um, versus what a team is willing to pay right now. You know, I think he's probably worth a good, you know, like a good contract. He's a good player. But at this stage of the offseason in June, not a lot of teams even have the money. Um, you know, they've mostly spent their cash budgets and, you know, they probably feel that corner isn't as pressing of a need as they may have felt, you know, in March or April. Um, so for him, I would say like if the team offers like a one year, six, seven million, you know, maybe, maybe even that's a, a touch rich, um, you know, that's where I see that going. Um, you know, Bashad Breeland, another guy where he's been on it, you know, the chiefs, you know, he's been the, probably the best corner on the chiefs for a couple of years now, but he was there for a one year, $2 million deal. And then a one year, two and a half million dollar deal. So I think he's probably looking for a payday. Um, and I just don't know if he's going to get it. You know, I think teams think that he can kind of be schemed up. Um, he's a good player. He plays a lot of press man, can kind of can be on an island at times, but you know, I guess they think that defensive front for Kansas City was, you know, more the hero there than, than the back seven uh, or, or you know the secondary. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's kind of a, a separation of, of the value there. And I think the players probably w- will need to come down ultimately to get something done. Brad, we love talking football with you and football and money because those two things have been married together in a national football league at this stage of the season. It's a very important marriage that you try and come up with. Uh, We appreciate you hopping on board with us. You know, we'll be uh, buzzing you again as the offseason plays on. Thanks for jumping in with us. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, Brad. That is Brad Spielberger from Pro Football Focus here with us on Birds 365. He's John McMullen. I'm Jody McDonald. We'll come back. Another guest yet to come next hour. And I got some big news for you, Jody. Big news after the break. After the break. Oh, John McMullen teasing our life away, looking for a sunny day. Uh, Triple Mac attack. Tim McManus going to join us next hour. But come back. Johnny Mac breaking news here on Birds 
365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.